Aloha, Aloha United We Stand. Uh, those are the people who send us guests every Thursday at noon, and that's why we call this show Aloha United We Stand. And we meet the most incredible people. I mean, week after week, it's wonderful to meet guys like you. Okay, uh, Paulette Bethel, PhD, uh, and what, Masters of? Public Administration. Public Administration. Yes. And you're the president of uh, Family Programs Hawaii. Yes, yes I Thank am. you for coming down. Okay, and uh, Jennifer O'Donnell, you are, what, a, a case manager? Yes. For Family Programs Hawaii. Yeah. Thank yes. you for coming down. Thanks for having <laughs> us. <Yes>. So, <clears throat> Family Programs Hawaii, qu'est-ce que c'est ça? That's French. <laughs> <laughs> so, a family prim, family program family programs Hawaii is a nonprofit agency in in the Hawaii community that provides prevention, support, and transition services for children and families that are involved in the foster care system, um, as well as we provide um, some adoption services connected to moving the children from being in foster care, hopefully oh. into permanent home. So it all drives with the foster care program. Yes. And, and the uh, adoption services you provide are only in the case where children have been in the foster program. Foster in, care. in our specific case, yeah. yes. <clears throat> okay. How long has it existed? Uh, Family Programs Hawaii um, began in 2005. Mm -hmm. It came about as the um, combination of two other agencies, KC Family Programs and um, Foster, um, I'm sorry, uh, Friends, of Friends of Foster Kids came together in 2005 and became Family Programs Hawaii. So we've been around um, 10 years. Okay. Yes. Um, and and what, is, what is the need you're satisfying in, you know, in terms of the community? I mean, what are, it's about the kids, right? And and um, you know, if you didn't exist, uh, you know, in the in the ghost of Christmas future, you know, you went away somewhere, and the kids wouldn't have anybody to watch over them. I mean, aside from the foster care system mm -hmm. itself. So you you're sort of watching the foster care system. Well, what or we are do you the foster care system? I'm sorry. Are you? Perhaps you are. Do you administer the law? No, actually, that's the Department of Human Services, okay. and so uh, we um, have different contracts and grants that we use to provide the right kinds of supportive services for these kids and the families that support them. So I share that we, we do it in three tiers. One of them is prevention services. Okay. So we um, have a contract with the state where we work with families that have been identified in the child welfare system. Um, because of um, allegations or abu of abuse or neglect. So and it, we go in and work with the children and work the trigger, with their families. That's abuse or neglect. Yeah, in, in, in abuse or neglect. So yeah. we will go in and work with families, and, and I can have Jennifer speak a little more to that. But we go in and work with families to help them be able to have the support and the resources that they need to hopefully not formally enter the child welfare system. Ah. Right, yes. What is the child welfare system? Just so we get the icons straight, what is that? Okay, so you want to take that one? Um, foster care, basically, when we're, when we're for all practical purposes. Mm -hmm. And for prevention, my colleagues at Voluntary Case Management, so if there's a family that their, their child is at risk of being removed from that home, but the parent is open to getting help to make that home a safer place so the child doesn't have to be removed. Because so there's a lot of trauma involved. You intervene involved. before the child is placed in the foster care. Yeah, because ideally yes. you want their family of origin to be able to continue to care for them, yeah. just with some support yeah. and just to make sure that there's someone that will see that family on a regular basis, make yeah. sure the child is still safe, yeah. but offer whatever services they need so the child, child doesn't have to be taken from that family because that's pretty traumatic for a kid, even if there is... A situation that's not ideal they love their parents they want to stay there so voluntary case management the parent can say yes I could use the help and then the those case managers will work with them do visits uh, make sure that they're getting the services they need so those children don't enter foster care okay I see that. and that's your primary and, and that's right on one of our primary preventing and preventing yes so that's foster one of our, care from happening okay. from happening how yes, did you get into this part how did I get into this well um, Getting into this work, I am a, a licensed marriage and family therapist by background, and I've I served in the Air Force for 15 years, and I primarily did program management kinds of work. Um, the same in, kind of thing? 
Mm -hmm. So with, with kids and families? No, actually I was a logistics manager okay. uh, and managed programs. And so between those two careers, um, I, I heard about Family Programs Hawaii and the great work that they do and um, that they were looking for a CEO. So I applied for the position and here I am. I've been in this position for about 18 months now mm -hmm. and loving being a part of this great agency and the work that we do. You know, I have a fabulous staff, as you, know, you can see with uh, Jennifer sitting next to me, and it's a very, very rewarding. Um, the work that we do at the agency is really rewarding, and it's really important to the community. How big is your staff? So we have a staff of 66. Oh, we yes, we have 66. Um, we have our office over um, on Vineyard. Yes. And we have a receiving home that's out in Maile. And that's another part of the, the prevention. So let's say that, yeah. um, a child has been identified or children have been identified to be removed from the home. So we have a home, uh, Ho'omalu, that's out in Maile, that when children have been removed the, from their homes, and especially in sibling groups, and we can talk a little bit about why keeping it's those really groups delicate together with is siblings, so doesn't important, it? Yeah. is that, the, that we have a home, and it's a very much a home-like environment, atmosphere, where these kids are temporarily placed with us while um, DHS looks for appropriate placements for these children. Ideally it would be with a family member, with a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle, but if that's not possible then identifying a, um, a foster family or a resource um, uh, support family to help these kids and be able to transition into the homes. Okay, so the case managers like Jennifer are the ones who actually do hands-on here. <clears throat> you're going you're gonna to find out that there's abuse or neglect what do you do? Uh, well, actually, my job, I'm, I work with the teenagers. So I'm, I help with their they're transition. The most aren't they? Oh, they're the most fun, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think even if they come from circumstances where they've, ha they've experienced trauma and maybe they've lived with several different family members, been in different foster homes, different shelters, they still have goals, they still have hopes, they still have dreams for their future. And so really what my job is, is I work with the ones that are getting close to their 18th birthday, um, where they're going to transition into their adult life, and I help them. Are you them. finished with them then? No, no, I'm, I'm just getting started with them <laughs> because I help them with whatever goals they have for their future, particularly if they want to further their education. Uh, my job is really to help them with um, getting financial aid, getting scholarships, doing college applications. How long does it last? Until 43, 44? Until <laughs> they get that degree, hopefully. Really? <laughs> um, through college? Uh, yeah, we, we help them through college. I mean, the, the program I work with, Excel, was originally designed to be maybe about a year of support, but we don't turn them away. Um, um, so if they, I, I get them in their senior year, we get them into college, and then hopefully I continue to provide them with the support they need so that they're successful in college and that they are able to continue to make progress towards a degree. And I help with just other practical stuff they need to know, like writing resumes and just getting launched in their adult life. So uh, what's your background on this? Um, I've done it for quite a while. I've lived in Hawaii for 10 years, and I've worked for Family Programs Hawaii for over four years. And... I've worked doing uh, mentoring projects to find mentors for the teenagers in foster care. Um, I worked previously for Epic Youth Circle Program that does like transitional planning meetings so that youth is supported in their ability to create a plan for their future and have a support system to basically carry out that plan. And I've also worked as case manager for um, Halekipa Independent Living Program because there's a few agencies, um, nonprofits that support the transitioning foster youth. So we still, we work really well together and I've worked at all of them. So I. I have, I have contacts at all of them. You know, I mean, it raises the question of, um, of um, how many agencies does it take to take care of a child? I mean, there's a lot of agencies. You know, we counting them, there are hundreds of agencies out there. Are there too many agencies doing the same thing? Oh, I don't think so. I think we, uh, each agency kind of does the, the best at what they're good at, and then we kind of want to create... What's your special good? sauce that distinguishes you from all the other agencies dealing with kids who are abused and neglected? I think Family Programs why we do a great job of using volunteers in the community um, with our mentoring project, and uh, we do this awesome 
holiday party every year so that all the resource caregivers on the island, the foster parents, adoptive parents, legal guardians, they can come and have a uh, nice holiday party, they get a picture with Santa, and uh, the community has the opportunity to donate gifts to those children. It's really a, a really beautiful way for the community to care about those children and support them and support the, the caregivers. Um, and we also, we do uh, resource family support services, so it's it has a warm line where any foster parent on the island, if they need to know resources for the child they're caring for, where to take them to get a therapist, what, how do they get clothes, how do they get whatever that child needs, they can call the warm line and it's answered uh, business hours Monday through Friday mm. and they'll get support on how to best care for that child. Um, but they also do trainings for the resource caregivers because you want those families to be trained in how to best care for them because it's, it's hard to parent your own children. It's challenging. You need a lot of patience. You need a lot of time. And it's even more challenging to parent the children of somebody else, children that may have um, trauma in their history. So we want to make sure that those families are supported well so that those children don't have to move multiple times so that um, we really kind of channel that community support so that child has um, what they need to really be successful. Okay, we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, I want to go through that whole process again um, and find out exactly what happens day to day, who's involved, what choices do you have to make, what challenges you have in making this happen and satisfying the mission as established by the Board of Directors. Right? By the Board of Directors, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And in a quick answer to your question about what is our, our special sauce that makes us different, I think that we're unique in, if, if you listen to what Jennifer was describing, we're very high touch, right? And, and we're very hands-on and we're very high touch. And we look at what the needs are for those children across a spectrum of services that address the special needs everywhere from you know helping to prevent them from entering the system to helping them to transition into adulthood hopefully with better success because of the services that we've provided. High touch means what? That we're very hands-on and, and where she was sharing that. Personal with discussions. Kids, personal discussions. The time, quality time, time together. quality time. Just you and the and child. And de developing trust and having the right kinds of programs I think to support meeting those needs for children who are our future. Okay. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Uh, this is uh, Paulette Bethel and Jennifer O'Donnell. Aloha, this is Kelee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute, and I want to thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii. We are delighted to be partners with Think Tech because it gives us the opportunity to bring to you a show every week on Monday at 2 o'clock p.m. called Ehana Kako. Ehana Kako means let's work together because we believe that Hawaii will be a better place when everybody works together. And in what way? Well, at the Grassroot Institute, we research three basic areas and we invite guests to come on board from across the country, the state, and the nation to talk about a better economy, a better government, a better society. Now, aren't those things we all want? Indeed. If you'd like to have the latest research in terms of public policy, as well as ways in which we can build a better government economy and society, then tune in every Monday on Think Tech Hawaii at 2 o'clock p.m. for our fascinating guests on Ehana Kako. Let's work together. I'm Kaylee Aquino with the Grassroot Institute, and I'll see you then. Aloha. Okay, Family Programs Hawaii with uh, Paulette uh, the, uh, Bethel, uh, named after the street. Why? Or is it the same family? <laughs> we, we kind of suspect that it may be the same family, but we're really not sure. And okay, it sure sounds we like, like it to We me. like to think that we might be part of that <laughs> Bethel Street. All right. <laughs> and she's the uh, CEO of uh, Family Programs Hawaii, Jennifer O'Donnell. Uh, she is a uh, case manager. I, I'm not, is that the right title? Yes, you're correct. Case manager. Okay, back to you for a minute, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> I'm the neighbor of a family that argues, mm -hmm. and I hear sounds that suggest to me that there's abuse going on, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and um, there's been, you know, suggestions of this for a while. Right? So I call somebody, who do I call, the police? Who do I call? Do I call you directly? Do I call human services? Who do I call? in the average case? 
I would say if you hear, if you hear a disturbance next door and you're concerned about the safety of your neighbors, by all means, call 911, call HPD. They'd probably be the most tool. Okay, and how does it them. get from there to you? Uh, I think if there is concerns about children's safety um, and child welfare becomes involved. Um, child welfare is with Department of Human Services. Yeah, because the, the state has a hotline for child they abuse step to report in. to. Yes, and so. they, they can take physical custody of that child if they feel that child is being abused or neglected. Yes, yes, they, um, they do an investigation. Okay. Are they going to call you right away? Are they going to call you you know, on the way to their own, you know, station house, or are they going to call you when they make the investigation? Uh, I think if they determine, if they investigate and they determine that that child isn't safe in that home, um, they may call us because they're in need of a place for that child to stay immediately. And they don't have the resources to do that, but you do. Uh, we have Ho'omalu, the receiving home. Oh, we have Ho'omalu, the receiving home. Right? That's the receiving do that home. On that a, a turn on a dime, you can go there, right? It's 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 all it's already there. It's, it's already open, there. It's staffed. It, we, yeah. we're there are staffed other children 20, there at any right. given moment in time, right? So we're staffed 24 hours a day at Ho'omalu. Mm -hmm. um, in answer to your question, in terms of if a call comes through, the call would not come directly to us. It would go whether it's being uh, placed through 911 or you use the hotline that. Um, the child welfare system has for calling to report suspected cases of abuse and neglect. Then a social worker that's from um, DHS mm -hmm. will go out um, to do the investigation, initial investigation to determine is that child in immediate um, danger or harm and if they believe that it's an imminent kind of um, situation that the child does need to be removed then they would either have them contact a family member if that's appropriate. Have, have have who contacted them? Oh, the, the social workers. They would start contacting family. They would look for appropriate... Other families? Yes. Relatives? Relatives. Aunts? Right. Could Other relatives that somebody. might be available. Okay. So they might contact grandma to see if grandma is available, willing and able to take the child. It might be that because there's not an immediate uh, placement for the child, that might be where um, our home out in Maile would come in. They have to make a judgment call here. They'll make a, they'll so, make a and judgment And you're one call. of a number of options. I mean, mm -hmm. are they going to try to go to the family first, or are they going to say, you guys, you know, Paulette, Jennifer, would you go to the family for us? I mean, how does that work? No, that, that in this particular case would not be how it would happen. It would have to go officially through DHS, and when they make the determination, we will come in later, depending upon if the determination is made that in, in conjunction with the family court, that's where our, our um, voluntary case management program comes in, that we will work with families where it's been um, evaluated that, yes, there are some reasons to intervene, but not to the, the degree of removing a child from or children from the home. So, so that might then come to us for us to send our social workers, our case managers out to work with those families. Um, if there's a termination to remove the child from the home, we don't make that determination either. That is done through DHS and through yeah. the family court. Well, sometimes that gets violent, doesn't it? I mean, I mean people don't want to lose their children. People, and no, people don't want to lose their children. As Jennifer shared earlier, yeah. uh, children don't want to lose their families. The yeah. research and statistics clearly shows that so, so what you when do appropriate, in a so when appropriate, it's, it's always, you know, it's when appropriate and the situation warrants it that we do like to keep children with their families, but we're not going to keep them in an unsafe situation. Right. So part of DHS is going to determine, make Suppose a determination. Suppose it's deemed unsafe. What happens? Well, if they go in and they can see that the child has been uh, the physically The police get abused, involved and they come and to take the child away. Yes, and if they get in and they decide that that child is in imminent harm and they can see signs of, you know, physical abuse that endangers that child, they're going to remove that child well, from there, that child. There have been altogether too many deaths of children by abusive parents in this state. Yeah. I wonder about the military. Do you handle the military? Um, we do not handle the military. Um, that's done within the military system. There are times for our Ho'omalu home that there might be um, a group of siblings or a child that may come from a military home that will be placed in our Ho'omalu facility while they look for appropriate placement for... Who's they children. in this case with the military? In case it would still be DHS. Okay, because, so yes. DHS had, would have sort of a voluntary arrangement with the military. It's the military doesn't have to submit to state agencies, right? Or does it? That's a good question. You know, and I'm, I'm assuming in these cases, they, there are families that live out in our communities, and so if that call comes and the family lives out in the community, 
um, that's where it becomes that's, part of that Sure, business. and nobody right. is going to oppose that because right. this is an right. organization that's dedicated to it. Now, now <clears throat> you said um, your special sauce is, is kind of a hands-on thing. Yes. Um, I, and I, you know, when I, I grew up in social work, and I always loved social workers because they were kind of soft, fuzzy people. Mm -hmm. They liked everybody. They were therapists. They made you feel good. They made everybody feel good, especially their clientele. Um, so it always amazed me when I came to the state of Hawaii, which was my you know, adult upbringing, if you will, <clears throat> that the, thought, the, the social workers were not doing therapy. They were doing legal things, right? Right. That, that's different. It's different. And, and, and you don't have to be nice and warm and fuzzy <laughs> to do legal things. And maybe it's better that you're not. <laughs> right. So you guys are doing this, the soft and fuzzy, right? You're talking to them. You're, you're saying, what is, talking, what is bothering you? Right. Can I help you? What do you need from us? From, right. From but I think, you know, in many ways, yes, um, there's the soft and fuzzy for us. But we're also very focused on... Um, helping our families, helping the teenagers, as Jen works with, being able to identify tools, um, have skills, have access to the resources that will help them to be able to move towards normalcy in their lives, move towards success in their lives. I think that's why it's so critical in, in Jen's pro program specifically for working with the teenagers and helping them to have this, this chance and this hope at a more successful life. Um, I, I love to share that um, for the kids that we work with or the teens that we work with, we have an 86% success rate for them graduating from high school. Um, okay. Right. What about it? What about your success rate for keeping them out of for formal foster care? I, it, the last number I checked is we had an 82 percent success rate of good. the of the voluntary case management um, families that we work with. Mm -hmm. 82 percent of our families are successful in staying outside of the foster care system. That's great. It's, yeah, I think it's that's really terrific. Good. Right. Yeah, I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. So. Um, these, 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 you know, it, it comes down to what help means. Mm -hmm. um, you know, help can be the warm and fuzzy and the therapeutic kind of thing, but help can also be in so many people in the charitable organizations we've talked to um, are helping by getting someone else to help. You know what I mean? Uh, sort of doing, up, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're finding out what's needed and then you're getting somebody to answer that need. Because the, the, the client, so to speak, he doesn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. He has and teenagers, they never know anything, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so well, they have to find out who to talk to. Mm -hmm. And the best, their best friend wouldn't know, but you guys would know who they can talk to. Who they who can, can talk to them. and put them in, um, in touch with <clears throat> other agencies, other programs. We, um, we have strong collaborations within the community with other agencies. And one of the people we uh, are in partnership with is Aloha United Way and working with them around issues of the safety net and poverty prevention. Uh, we also have partnerships where we work with um, um, Epic Ohana, uh, PIDF, and, and what's that? Um, partners in development. Mm. Um, and we work together as a team to serve the best interest of our community and serve the best interest of the children, the teens, the families that we support. You know, it's always instructive to find out where your money comes from. So let me ask you, where does your money come from? I know by definition you're getting some money from uh, Aloha United Way. That's why we're here on the program. But right. where else does it come from? So Who is concerned about the issue that they would write checks to you? People in the community that really care about children and the well-being and the health and the safety net for children um, are a lot of the people in terms of the people that write the checks. So we get our funding from a variety of sources. We you know, have grants from community foundations and, and, and other organizations. We also have um, a couple of contracts with the state, one of them being voluntary case management, and the other one is a program to support the foster families that support our children. And we also um, do fundraising, like most other nonprofits here, to bring in vitally needed money to help us to be able to continue to provide the services when that we When you say do. fundraising, you mean fundraising to the public? To the public, to yes. mom and pop down the street, everybody. Mom and pop down the street, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is your job, isn't it, Paulette? Yeah. Yes, it is. This is not easy, is it? 
How do you, it's fun. How do you, you like it? Okay. Well, well that, that's what makes the CEO. Well, of course, yeah, position. and of course, it's challenging because you know we have, like you shared, we have um, other nonprofits in the community, and um, we're all working to try to be able to bring in the funds that we're that are needed for us to support our programs. Uh, one of our largest fundraising um, events does revolve exactly around providing these networking and support and connection opportunities for the kids and families and at the same time it helps us to bring in the money so that we can continue to provide what the services. What, what, is, what kind of an event is it? Okay, so we have an annual holiday party event for children. What, around um, this time of year? Around this time of the it's year. It's happening? It's already happened. It's already, ah, it's already so happened. So we can't go and tout it then. Yes. I'm sorry about that. Right. Well, we can tout that. <laughs> we, um, this particular event, with a tremendous amount of community support, we had um, 1,850 children and the foster families that support them attending this oh, event. Everybody comes. Every well, of course, it's about that connection too. So their yeah. foster sibling is there, their foster yeah. mom is there, their foster dad is there. If grandma is very much in the picture, it's just more involved, than a fundraiser. Yeah, it's so a whole there. networking. So, it's, it's, so they can get a reality test on all the other people who are getting your services. Getting there. Very valuable. And, you know. and in terms of community involvement, we usually have about 700 volunteers from the community that come in and help us put on this fantastic event that's designed for the children and to show community support. Volunteers are important to you. Volunteers are very important to um, us, yes. You have professionals. Jennifer's a professional. Jennifer's a professional. But you have, among the 66 you mentioned, there must be some volunteers in there. Well, or are they all paid staff? Um, the 66 are paid staff, and then we have um, approximately 1,500 volunteers that helped us out in a variety of ways. Jennifer mentioned the project visitation program that she used to be a part of, and that's designed to help sibling groups stay together because we know that sibling bond is so important, and we couldn't do that program without the generous support of our volunteers in the community. And this is where, if children have been separated in the foster care Ooh, system, as that happens, I guess. That does oh, happen if you can't, dreadful. especially if it's a large sibling um, family group. Yeah, but yeah. what part of what we do with the support of our volunteers is we bring these kids together. Uh, the volunteers will help get the kids together so they can see Get a van, their siblings. pick them up, take them to a park, mm -hmm. have them enjoy themselves. Well, the volunteers, like the volunteers will come and pick them up, and they will arrange to meet with the other um, um, resource family. That's so. If it's four siblings, and they may be in four homes, we, we I mean, the system oh, tries so not to do that. How do we keep track of them? Um, how do we you keep, keep? No, you do keep track of them. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Whatever they are, whatever they're doing, <laughs> whatever for this they're very doing. Purpose, yeah. Yes. At yes. least somebody is watching. Over somebody them. is you watching are. over them and ensuring that they are being able to see one another in a safe and secure environment uh, and that they do have that opportunity to spend that quality special time with their brother or sister. Now these people are, come from families which probably in, in some statistical you know, way are, are substantially damaged. The family would have to be damaged for the child to be abused. That's yes. the kind of logic that I have anyway. Um, is now, are these families from uh, disadvantaged economic um, groups or are they all across the board? As we know, they're all across the spectrum in terms is of socioeconomic, right? yes. Okay, I have, to, I have to digest on that, so we're going to take a break to allow me to digest. <laughs> we're going to come back, okay, and we're going to discuss exactly what it is this thing, um, uh, uh, foster, foster care, foster homes. How does that work? What happens when, when your, your client goes to a foster home? What's the experience like? And why do you work so hard to prevent that? <laughs> okay, we'll be right back. Okay. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon. And on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space. And uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Kaui Lucas. I am the host of Hawaii is My Mainland here every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii at 3 p.m. I invite people who are doing interesting and inspiring things in our community to help us keep it local and keep it real. Tune in any Friday, 3 p.m., 
and also available on our YouTube channel and my blog, kauilucas.com. Hawaii is my mainland. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. Uh, we're here with Jennifer and uh, Paulette uh, from Family Program Hawaii. Turning to you, Jennifer. Um, so I, I get the feeling, if I'm wrong, tell me, that you prefer that these kids stay with their family at whatever degree of sanguinity mm -hmm. um, and, rather, uh, and would rather not go to a foster situation. Mm -hmm. So I think people don't know what foster care is. You know, um, how exactly does it work and why, from a public policy point of view, is it better to direct the children elsewhere? Uh, well, f foster parents, they can be different walks of life. Um, they go through training um, so they, before they have a child enter their home. Um, there's also a number of relatives, like if, they're, if a child comes into foster care, they always look for extended family members because that's a little bit less traumatic for the child to go to somebody that they already know and have a relationship with versus um, being housed uh, with a stranger. Um, but yeah, they, they come into foster care and then they have social workers there to work with the foster family to monitor that child and their progress. And then there's also social workers that work with the family of origin to s make sure that those, those parents, they get a plan to work on to, they have to maybe take parenting classes or do other, th make sure they have safe housing, just work on whatever plan that the court puts in place for them so that they can work this at being court. reunited. Foster care on an involuntary basis, this has to be court ordered, is that right? Well, the um, voluntary case management program that Jennifer discussed, that one, it's done through the courts, but what will happen if the courts and, and um, Department of Human Services determines that um, there's moderate risk so that these families can go into that program, they're given the option to be able to participate in that program so that they can keep It's a voluntary children. matter. It's a voluntary matter for yeah. that particular program. Yeah. Not, but you have to manage that because sometimes it doesn't go smoothly. Sometimes right? it doesn't go smoothly. Yeah. I, I share that we have an 82% success rate so that That's lets you know that there's, there are some, yeah. some <laughs> cases where we do have, they, they are referred back into the system for a determination to be made. Well, is there ever a time where a judge says, uh, hey, you know, you're, you're trying to visit your kid in a, in a foster care situation or with another member of the family. And I told you, you could visit your kid on weekends, but not on weekdays. And um, now you're, you get, has this happened? That's one that I don't think either of us are qualified to <laughs> yeah. really respond to. But you yes, in the case, in the case of that, when children are, are put into a foster care situation, um, at some point when it's deemed appropriate, there might be visitations that are set up with the parents, but those are all supervised visitations, and it's all done not by us. That's another yeah, category that's done by DHS. Understood. But, mm -hmm. uh, the, but the default position would be the child is here and they stay there. Yes. I mean, and, the and child's maybe, safety and yeah. welfare is of paramount yeah. concern right. throughout. The, the child is not separated for for no reason, there no is a reason. reason. There is a reason that yeah. they've been removed from the home. Yeah. And as Jennifer shared, so if the child has been removed from the home, um, there will still be work that's being done by social workers to help that parent or those parents be able to set up a plan of action that will be designed to have their children return to the home. And that's very carefully monitored by the state in terms and of- you get a copy of that. Do I get a copy of- The plan of action. In this particular case, when that's happening, our agency is not a part of that particular okay. plan. Our agency is involved when um, it's a voluntary case management, and mm -hmm. then we go in, and in conjunction with the social workers from the state, we will provide those necessary support systems and safety nets and resources to support that family in keeping their child in the home. Okay, I want to unpack this thing. You know, you mm -hmm. told me there were three things. Mm -hmm. One is prevention. Mm -hmm. Yes. One is support. And I guess that means uh, support after a placement of some kind has been made. Mm -hmm. yes. And the third is transitional services. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure what that is. So why don't you define how that works? I guess you're involved in all of those three. Yeah, uh, but transition is really my thing. Cause, okay. Um, because those children, they're not going to be children forever. They're going to grow into adults. Um, so. Uh, in the past, social uh, foster care at 18, they're like, okay, you're an adult. Go be an adult. You don't fall under child welfare anymore. Um, but we've seen that that 
set those children up to then experience homelessness, um, yeah. not finish high school. Oh, it's really result, hard to make your way result, in this yeah. world as a young adult if you don't have much support. So mm -hmm. um, in the past decade, I think the, uh, the state of Hawaii in particular, we've done a reasonably good job at, at enhancing the supports that are available to those youth as they turn 18, 19, 20, and they're finding their way as adults. And I think it's important because you don't want um, foster care and involvement with child welfare to be a generational thing in their family. Oh, no. So if you can intervene with those young people, help them in a very positive way. I usually, every, every young person I meet, I look at what are their strengths? What are they good at? What are their goals in life? And we help, help them. them in life. Yeah, support them to have what they need to be their best self. Um, so you're, the, you're their social worker. You're their counselor. Um, yeah, as a case manager, I really, I kind of assess where where they're at now. Are they on track to graduate high school? Do they need any supports to graduate high school? Um, and then if they want to further their education, because my uh, project I work for is Excel. It's really focused on um, guiding them to higher education goals. So we look at, you know, if their goal is to be a nurse or their goal is to be a teacher or their goal is to be um, is to do cosmetology we look at what programs are available for you and how can we get you there and i do a lot of work with um, applying for scholarships helping them write a personal statement wow. for scholarships how, how often are you available i mean it's, you sound like in local parentis um well i usually i meet with my young people my students at least once a month but more if they need me um if it's like there's things lots of deadlines their senior year in high school in particular where they need to um, apply for financial aid, they need to apply for uh, their college. Jennifer, this stuff. boy likes me. <laughs> he wants to take me out, but I'm not so sure because he comes from a, a family or a situation that may not be good. Jennifer, tell me what to do. Oh, I would just say, tell me more about this boy. <laughs> I kind of, I try to be a little bit of a big sister sometimes yeah, yeah. and um, meet them where they're at. Uh, but yeah, usually, sometimes they come to me with their interpersonal stuff. But mostly, I, I look at big picture. Um, Some of the occupation. Yeah, so what, what are their long-term goals? Let's write your resume. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And yeah. we have a number of um, programs that support the transition. So uh, we have a mentoring program. So we can link the young people with a mentor that can help be there just to kind of do like fun a stuff business with them. guy from the business community that kind of thing yeah and actually our mentoring program does a really great job of finding peer mentors so uh, young adults who were in foster care oh, previously that's good. They really understand yeah that, they right? really understand where the young people are coming from they were in foster care themselves they go through training on how to be a good mentor and then they mentor the younger ones to be successful so that's in the their transitional life. you've been talking about mm -hmm. yeah we do okay. mentoring we also have a yes Hawaii that provides like pro social fun activities for the youth to do so they do like a halloween party and a little thanksgiving get together, together. they go beach barbecues children in multiple families getting together yeah it's any young person um or young adult who's young left adults. foster care right. yeah who um they just need maybe time to connect with other youth that are come it's from similar really important. situations I, I, one common denominator among all the shows that we've done the talk shows we've done with organizations like yours you know that deal with young people is they need um, an organization, they need uh, a community of people like them. They need to go somewhere every week and meet and do, mm -hmm. do have an activi activity of some kind. <clears throat> it makes a huge world of difference for it them. It makes a world of difference for them to be able to, to build connections that can go with them. Yeah. You know, because once they age out of the um, foster care system, I'm not saying that they won't necessarily remain connected with that foster family, but unlike Jennifer and myself, where when I graduated from high school, I still had my family support there, my family connections to help me as I transitioned more into adulthood. But and you so don't a lot have of these, that. So these You're transition programs are designed thing. to help yeah. them build skills, yeah. um, build relationships around uh, being successful adult, you know, um, with with a good life, and that that's the goal for us is that they grow up and experience happy, successful lives. I mean, it's and what we all want. You tell me, that over eighty percent of the time, they do. For the the for the youth that we work with in terms of high school graduation, yes, over eighty six percent of the time our youth graduate from high school, which is a phenomenal rate because the numbers for foster care in terms of kids graduating from high school are actually um, far below that no, number of 86 I was listening to uh, NPR this morning talk about the dropout 
crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not limited to Hawaii, maybe the country, but nevertheless, it is tragic to see a kid drop right. out of high school. And I, I think part of that special sauce for us is, as Jen has been sharing, is yeah. she provides a tremendous support system to help them to be able to continue towards those goals. And, and yes, maybe able to come over to her and, and talk to her about things beyond just school that may be interfering with their ability to stay focused in school. And that could be personal. And that could, that could be. So how long does it go? I mean, I was joking before when I said 43, but, um, you know, do you talk to them about graduate school? Do you talk about a profession? Do you talk to them about um, getting married? Um, um, yeah, actually, one of my a house, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my young people that I work with, she's finishing a bachelor's degree, and our goals this coming year is to help her apply to get a master's degree and get into a graduate school. So, uh, yeah, we kind of follow them as long as they need uh, regarding their education. A lot of them are in their early twenties, um, and it's kind of flexible case by case as long as they need us. Um, my colleague uh, Judy is launching a really uh, neat new she's also program. She's case manager. Uh, yeah, she's yeah. launching, uh, it's called Skills to Success, uh, where they're going to have uh, meetings that bring the resource caregiver, that foster parent, adoptive parent, um, that will come in with their teenager, uh, come in and they can do different sessions on employment skills, um, financial literacy, um, setting education goals. And then, yeah, and then so the parent gets kind of professional support to guide that young person. Um, but then the resource caregiver gets training hours for their foster home license. And then we're hoping maybe we can get the gift cards to entice the teenagers to come to the meetings too. So we're going to launch that. Um, I think it's going to be, they're going to have their first meetings at uh, the beginning of the year. Um, so that's really exciting. And uh, yeah, we just have a lot of different support we also, um, I don't know if you want to talk, talk about enhancement funds, but we um, administer those for the youth okay. too. Yeah. Um, but I'm left with one question, though. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're you're adopting these kids. You're taking them under your wing. You're connecting them with people who will help them. You're following up, even for years. Um, you're you're in local parentis in many ways. Uh, and you're, you're the connection between them and the We're future. We're the connection between them and the but future, yes. What about the families they have left, the families who neglected or abused them? Uh, you mentioned that sometimes those families need help, and yes. uh, you refer somebody back to that family, maybe from human services to go it's back from there. the human services where... You know, because a family who's been neglecting a child, their own born child, um, who, you know, does need help, for sure, and those families, by definition, are dysfunctional and good that we get the children to be functional, which you guys are working on. But what about those families? Do they wind up getting divorced? Do they get in trouble? Are they already in trouble? What, what kind of burden are they to the community after you have done your, your, your thing? I would not be able to really give you any specifics on what happens with them because that's not the focus of our agency. Um, but there are programs in the community because we recognize how important family is and there's a big push towards the strengthening of families. So if there is a family that, yes, there may be some neglect going on, but there are programs and social workers, not our agency, that will work with those families to help them to be able to maybe get some necessary counseling that they need, you help will. them with skill sets. You will. Um, not my agency. What agency? Oh, other agencies. Other agencies in, that, in the yeah. community will, will take care of those. And so there are programs out there because we recognize that intact families, when it's appropriate for children to be with their families, that actually has the best outcomes for children. Sure. And so sure. they want to be, be able to say, identify with parents. With their parents, with their families. It's so hard there to go are to programs school designed and, and to help say you them. Don't have Parents, you know, right. it's better to have parents. It's it's better to have parents, and yeah. and so um, so there are programs out there to support them because we are looking at this. Um, a lower United Way is looking at this very holistically, and looking at what can we do to help provide the supports, the the safety nets, the resources to ensure that. Families have what they need, have the support that they need, and then, and in Hawaii is, you know, really when you look at it nationally, so Hawaii does a really good job because of the strong ohana here, that we can work with families and help them. And in terms of our kids, 
I, you know, one of the reasons I love programs like the one that Jennifer is with is because by working with these youth and helping them to have access to the resources, the life skills, the knowledge, then they have a greater chance okay. at we, a successful future. We're out of time, future. actually, Paulette. Um, thank you, Paulette. Okay. Uh, Paulette uh, Bethel and uh, Jennifer O'Donnell. Family Programs Hawaii, it's been great to learn about what you do, and uh, it's wonderful to hear what you do and that you do it. Well, thanks Thank for having so. us. We really appreciate being Thank here. Thank you for that. Yeah, Thank, Thank you, you. Jennifer. Aloha. All right. Aloha. 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 Alo